<laughs> okay, let's get started, please. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, continuity and connectedness. So connectedness is something that uh, I've sort of left to you to read, um, but um, uh, if you recall, we say that a set is connected if um, it cannot uh, be expressed as um, a union, A union B, where uh, <coughs> A intersect the closure of B and uh, A closure intersect B are both of them. Cannot be expressed. Um, uh, cannot be expressed <coughs> as a union of non-empty, non-empty separated sets. I should say that A and B can't, you don't, you don't allow A and B to be empty. Okay. Okay. So, um, and, okay. So, so, and we also had this theorem, which, you know, I, I just had to read, which said that, um, that if you are a connected set in the real line, then you have this property that um, that uh, so uh, E in the real line is connected if and only if it has the property that whenever X and Y are in your set, then uh, the whole interval <coughs> right the whole interval the whole open interval of x comma y is in the set okay so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna prove this side we're just gonna go on with uh, what we're doing right now yes Lana. so that's like the close interval right that's the what close interval right this is the open interval, the open interval. Sort of x and y line, what are the points themselves? Oh, yeah, okay, so yes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, okay. So today we're going to uh, talk about um, the interaction of, of continuity and connectedness. And we're going to get, um, you know, the, uh, the theorem, the something that you saw back in, in COP1, the intermediate value theorem. Okay. Um, so uh, here's the theorem. Suppose you have uh, x and y metric spaces, and you have some function going from x to y. Um, if f is continuous uh, and uh, e is connected. Then the then f of e is also connected. Then f of e is also connected. Okay. So the continuous image, right? So the continuous image of a connected set is connected. So the way we're going to prove this is by contraposition. We'll show that um, if f, if the image can be expressed as separated sets, then e can be expressed as separated sets. 
Okay. So um, if f can be expressed as separated sets, then uh, e will be expressible as, as separated sets, as a union of non empty separated sets. So here we go. Um, suppose that uh, f <coughs> is expressible as a union of a union of non-empty separated sets. Okay. Well, in that case, if you take the inverse image of it, <coughs> um, the inverse image of a union is the union of the inverse images. So you get um, f inverse of a union f inverse of b. Did I turn the camera on? Is it off? Uh, so I think it might be. You look, you look worried. It's on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, Lara. Are separate sets just disjoint sets? Uh, no, no. So, um, <coughs> so uh, it's true that if you're separated, then you're disjoint. Okay. Right? Because look, the intersection of A with the closure of B is empty. Right, so that means that the intersection of A and B is also empty. Mm -hmm. Right, so separated implies implies disjoint. Mm -hmm. Right, but not the opposite. Right, because you could have something like this. Um, uh, you could build A using the limit points of B, and then maybe you would be able to get what you are trying to do. If you throw in a limit point of B into A then it will intersect with the, con with the, with the closure, but not necessarily with the efficiency inside itself. Right, right. So, right, so you could have something like this, um, something like this, right? So this, the these guys are disjoint, right? These guys are disjoint, but the, the closure of this guy intersects this guy, right? So if I call this a B, A intersect closure of B is this is this point in the middle here. Okay. So it's not it's not similar, right? So they're disjoint, but they're not separated. Okay. Okay, yeah, Max. In the bottom line of the proof right there, shouldn't that be E on the left side? <coughs> or F inverse of F of E? F inverse of F of E. Yeah, thank you. Which is E. <laughs> so E is this, yeah. Okay. Okay. And so we're going to show that um, uh, F inverse A and F inverse B are separated. Okay, and that will be that will be trouble because E wasn't E was supposed to, right so I mean that will that will give it to us. So if the image is, is separable then the then the original thing is, is separable. Okay. okay. So, um, okay. so these guys are, are um, so A and B are separated. Means that um, A intersects B closure is empty, that A closure intersect B is empty. Okay. And so uh, we know that F inverse of A intersect B closure is, is empty. F inverse of A closure intersect B is empty. Right. But then 
you know, the inverse image of, a, of an intersection is the intersection of the inverse images. We get this. So far, we haven't really done anything, right? Nothing, nothing impressive. Um, and you notice that we haven't used continuity. So now we're going to use continuity. So since f is f is continuous, right? Since, since f is continuous, f inverse b closure is closed. Um, The inverse image of a closed closed set is going to be closed. Right. Um, so <coughs> f inverse b is contained inside of f inverse b closed. Right. Since this is contained inside of that guy, and this which is closed, this and this thing is closed, we get that um, f inverse B closure is contained inside of F inverse B closure. Because okay. it's contained inside of this thing, this guy is closed, so when you close it, you're still inside it, you're still inside of that. Okay, but what does that give you? Um, we know that F inverse A intersect this larger set is empty. So certainly f inverse, f, inverse, f inverse A intersect this set is empty, right? Since f inverse A intersect the thing it's contained in is empty, well, certainly f inverse A intersect this thing is going to be empty, right? And so we get f inverse A intersect the closure of f inverse B is empty. Okay. And similarly, we get the opposite, right? f inverse A closure intersect f inverse B Similarly, f inverse a closure intersect f inverse b is also empty. right, and so we get uh, we ex we've expressed uh, so these guys so these sets are separated. So if the image was separated, then uh, then e was also could also be separated. Yes. Never mind. I just wrote something. Okay. This is not a particularly exciting proof. Um, uh, all we're using is the continuity, right? So there's some simple set of setbacks. Right, set theoretic facts, and then we use continuity, and that's that's it. Okay. Any any questions? Any questions? Okay, let's go on. Um, <coughs> So the corollary is the intermediate value term. Intermediate value term. Intermediate value term from calculus. So if you recall, um, uh, if you have a continuous function um, and uh, f of a is less than f of b, then, then for any uh, gamma between uh, any any number of gamma between f of b, f of a, and f of b, um, there exists some point in a b where 
f of x is that, is that value. So the picture is that you have A, B, you've got F of A, and you've got F of B, right? And F of, F of A is, is smaller than F of B, and you choose any value <coughs> gamma, any value gamma between those guys, and the intermediate value theorem says that you know, there's got to be a point where you attain that value. Right? There's got to be some x where you actually hit, you actually hit that line. It seems sort of obvious, right, that, that at some point, you know, if your function is, as long as your function is continuous, well, you've got to cross that line at some point, right? So it seems, seems pretty, pretty obvious. But of course, if we were not in the real numbers, if we were in the rational numbers, then there, there could be holes there, and we might not even touch the line. So it's not, it's not, it's not completely obvious. Okay. Um, that is, it, re it relies actually on uh, the, least up and down property, which is what we use to prove the fact uh, about, the, about, about connected sets in the real line. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so what's the proof? What's the proof? We just said, right, if you if you have a connected connected set and you hit it with a continuous function, you get a continuous image, right? So, what do we know? We know that f of a comma b is connected, right? A continuous image of a connected set is still going to be a connected set. You get, did I say continuous image? I hope not. Um, I should have said connected image, right? The continuous uh, image of a connected set is connected, right? so it's connected. Okay, right? Well, and then we have these two points in it, right? F of A and F of B are in that image. Right? And so by the theorem about connected sets in the real line, we know that every point between this, right? So the whole interval, right? F of A, F of B is in the image of F. Right? The whole, it, the whole, right? This whole line here is in the image of F. Right? This whole, this whole segment, this closed segment, um, is is in the image of F. Right. Well, that means that um, if I choose anything here, there's some point where you hit it. Right. So any so any any gamma between right between f of a and f of b uh, lies in the image, which is what what it says. Right. Any any gamma any gamma between f of a and f of b uh, must be an output. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. Yeah, all right. This is probably a really dumb question. That's right. That's right. I don't understand the notation. The interval of f of a to f of b is. Uh. So f of a b is the is the inner the closed interval on the like quote unquote y axis in your picture. Yep. In the, in the range. Uh -huh. yeah. it's, I mean, if you want to think of it this way, it's probably better. Like A, B, F of A, F of B. Right? And what we're saying is that, um, that this, is, <coughs> this, is a, this, is a, uh, this is a connected set. Well, that means that the image is going to be connected. So 
if you're connected in R1, that means that whenever you have two points, everything between is in the set, right? So what does that tell you? That um, that the image of the image of f is this whole thing here. So if I choose any gamma in here, I, I'm going to hit it. Right? Any gamma between f of a and f of b is an output. It's realizable as an output. <coughs> So why does that happen? Because since the output, since the image is connected and we contain these two points, we contain all points in between. So all points in between are in the image of that. Right? All, points, all points in between are in the image of that. Yeah, sometimes it's better. Yeah, so this is the cup one way of thinking, right? It's, it may be best to just forget about that. <laughs> right? This is the graph, the graph way of thinking. Right? But really, it's probably better to think of it as maps. But, um, how how do we know that like the, the gram is not gonna go like up above FB or anything like that? Like, <coughs> curve up or like, oh, it, but how do we know it's it the, the range? It could. It could. Okay. It could. But. Uh, we, you know, so it may well be that the the image actually goes goes higher than this. Uh -huh. But all we're using is the fact that if these two guys are in there, right? If these two guys are in there, then we uh, we get the whole uh, gamut, the whole range from from here to here okay. of values. Okay. It may well go up, but that doesn't that doesn't hurt us. The fact that we that we want still is true. Okay. Okay. Can we okay. also conclude from this that the image will be an interval or no? That uh, the image of an interval will be an interval and a continuity? Or no? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, the next, so I have to say that the rest of this section is not particular, not particularly exciting. Uh, if you've read it, you know, you know um, that it's not exciting. It's about discontinuities, about mon monotonic functions, and about limits and infinity. I guess limits and infinity are, are sort of interesting, but um, but yeah, it's not. Uh, so you know, if you if you feel kind of um, if you feel kind of bored about this, then that just shows you a good taste. <laughs> now this stuff that you that you just saw, if you were avoided with that, then your taste is not that good. This is actually kind of interesting, it's, but although not you know remarkably interesting. Okay. But um, if you get bored for the next uh, ten minutes, then I will not blame you. Okay. I mean, it, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to skip it, but I still want you to read it. So. We'll do it. <laughs> okay, so discontinuities, discontinuities on R1. Okay, so this is sort of um, doing stuff that uh, formalizing things that you've that you've seen before. Right-handed limits, left-handed limits, right? Um, so maybe you've seen these sorts of things in, in, in calculus, right? You have some you have some function, and it. It has a different limit from the left from, as from the right, compared to from the right, right? So you've got some uh, L1 and you've got some L2, and the limit from the left-hand side is L1, the limit from the right-hand side uh, as you approach your point P is, is L2, right? Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna write this down in our neighborhood notation first. So you have, um, uh, you have F, a function on A B going into R one. F a function on A B. Uh, so F it's on R one and it goes into R one. And you have X uh, in the uh, half closed interval uh, A comma B. If there exists a Q in R one such that 
Um, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that um, uh, whenever p lies in x, x plus delta, uh, f of p lies in the epsilon neighborhood of q, um, then we say f x plus equals q. You're more used to writing this as the limit of f of x as x approaches, sorry, the limit of f of uh, z as z approaches x from the right hand side is q. Nothing, there's no limit on the left hand side. Um, so, um, so what are we saying here? <coughs> that there's a limit from the right hand side. What is that? What is that? What does that mean? That means that um, if we take any epsilon, p plus epsilon, p, q minus epsilon, right? Then there's a right-handed interval, right? There's a right-handed interval in which that, that epsilon is satisfied. Okay. There's a half interval, right? So previously when we talked about the, about the limit, we required that a punctured neighborhood map into that, map into that epsilon, epsilon neighborhood, right? And now we're saying that all we want is the right half, right half of that punctured neighborhood. Right? We just want the right half of the function neighborhood to map into the epsilon neighborhood. And if, that, if we can find that, that half delta neighborhood, then we, uh, for, for every epsilon, then, uh, then the right handed limit exists. Okay, yeah, Lyra. Why are we taking a half close interval? Because we're only caring what happens to the right side of, of x. Mm -hmm. Right? So, you know, if. Um, Right, because we're we're trying to model this sort of behavior, right? That that there's a limit for, as you approach from the right hand side. So we look at x x plus gamma, right? That's that's saying we're looking at stuff only on the right hand side of x. Yes, yeah, so I understand that. Okay. But when it when it says that x belongs to closed interval A and an open interval B, mm -hmm. um, how would things change if it was closed interval A to B? Well, if we say um, B closed, then you could have something like this, where your function is defined here, A to B, and you're talking about a right-handed limit of B, <laughs> but there's nothing to the right of B, okay. right? There's, we, that's the end of the world. Okay. Okay. So I hope people are getting this, right? Right-handed limit equals Q. Similarly for for similarly. Left handed limits. Right? And, um, right? And how would I define right continuity? How would I define right continuity? What do I need to do to, to modify this definition to have right continuity? Change the half interval to x minus. Change. Let's do x, x minus delta. Uh, no, that's that'll be left. Uh, oh. Oh. That'll be left. I want right continuity. So this okay, is half of the delta. Half of the delta. Half of the delta. No. No. Remember, what's the difference between the limit and continuity? You include that point, right? So you, you make the punctured neighborhood non-punctured, right? So what do we need to do? We just need to close the interval. Okay. If we close that interval, then that's the definition of, of right continuity. Okay. And similarly for left continuity. So we have continuous, left continuous.
Okay. So, um, okay. So now for another uh, definition, not, partic not particularly exciting. Um, if f is discontinuous at x, but the uh, left and right limits exist, then we uh, call x a simple discontinuity. A simple discontinuity. Or a discontin discontinuity of the first kind. Okay. So this is saying that your function is discontinuous, but you know, it's, it's got a limit from the left-hand side and it's got a limit from the right-hand side, right? So it's not that bad. It's not, um, uh, you know, um, like you could define some function, like <coughs> f of x is one if x is rational and zero if x is irrational, right? That you know, is not a, Right, so at, at every rational point, it's one. At every irrational point, it's zero. Okay. Well, that's that's not a simple discontinuity. Right. Here, it's got no limits from left to right. Right. So this is <coughs> this is discontinuous everywhere, and all the discontinuities are the, are, are of the second kind. So um, uh, we're going to prove one result about these uh, discontinuities dealing with monotonic functions. Monotonic functions. Um, so uh, I probably don't need to write down this definition. So monotonically increasing, what does monotonically increasing mean? How would you describe monotonic interest increasing mathematically? What does it mean to be an increasing function, Max? If b is greater than a, then f of b is greater than f of a. Okay, right. So whenever you know you've got input values that you know one is to the right of of, of, of the other, then the uh, the outputs preserve that relation. Okay, and we're going to use. Um, so this is, we're going to have it like this. Um, so this is going to be called monotonically increasing. If this is true, we say f is monotonically increasing. Okay. Right. And of course, if it's, if it's the opposite way, we call it monotonically decreasing. I don't think we'll, 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 we'll use it, but um, to indicate that it's, uh, that it's actually, uh, it cannot be equal to, then people usually say strictly. Okay, they'll say strictly monotonically, strictly increasing, strictly decreasing. Okay, but this is usually what people call increasing, decreasing. even though it could be flat. Right, the, the, a constant function by this definition is monotonically increasing as well as decreasing. So, um, okay. so uh, here's the theorem that um, if f is monotonically increasing on some interval a, b, then one, um, the limit from the left-hand side and the limit from the right-hand side always exist. Okay. So you always have uh, left and right-handed limits. For monotonic functions, you're always going to have a left limit and always going to have a right limit. Okay. And two, 
um, for x and y such that a is less than x is less than y is less than b, we get um, the uh, right-handed limit of x has to be less than or equal to the left-handed limit of y. The right-handed limit of x must be less than or equal to the right-handed limit of y. So here's x, here's y, right? You've got your monotonic increasing function. Um, and saying that the limit from the right-hand side here must be less than or equal to the limit from the left-hand side here. So the right-handed limit here must be less than or equal to the left-handed limit here. Okay. So that's, that's, that's probably pretty, that seems pretty obvious. The proof will be uh, commensurately simple. Okay, okay. So um, <clears throat> let's prove the first guy. Okay. Um, the fix at x in AB. Okay. And uh, we want to show that, uh, let's show that the left handed limit exists. We want to show that the left handed limit exists. Here, and you want to show that the left the left-handed limit exists. So um, we claim that uh, 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 the supremum of the values where t is less than x. Right, is the left-handed limit. So you just take all the all the values on the left hand side, right? Take all the values on the left hand side and take the supremum of them, and that we claim that that's going to be the limit from the left hand side. Okay. So um, let's let's call this thing let's call this thing A. So you want to show that that thing is the limit from the left-hand side. Um, that means that given any interval, we want to show that the guys on the left-hand side map into, um, so we want to show that given any epsilon, um, there exists a delta such that um, x minus delta comma x is mapped into uh, our neighborhood of A. Okay. Okay. We want to show that there's some left-handed there's some left-handed interval, right? So given <coughs> the line, you want to find a left-handed interval that gets mapped into that into between those bars. Well, since A is the supremum, right? A is the supremum of uh, values less than x, right? We know there must be some um, there must be some t naught smaller than x, uh, where f of t naught is bigger than a minus delta, a minus epsilon. Right, why is that? How do we know that? Right, otherwise, um, uh, if there were nobody like that, well then A minus epsilon would be your upper bound, right? Right, 
right? Otherwise, a minus epsilon would be an upper bound, right? But a was supposed to be the least upper bound. A was supposed to be the least of them. So, so we know that there's got to be, right, so A minus epsilon, there's got to be somebody, um, there's got to be some point T naught where we go higher than A minus epsilon. Right? There's got to be some point where that happens. But then, um, so let, so we're going to take that, we're going to take that distance to be our delta, right? The distance between T naught and X is going to be our delta, this distance here. So let, let delta, delta be um, x minus t naught, right? In other words, t naught was actually x minus delta. Okay. Right? And then we're, um, then we're done, right? Why are we done? We found the, we've got this delta, we've got this left-handed delta neighborhood, right? And we know that at this point we cross into the epsilon neighborhood. And what about all the points between here and here? Where are they going to be? We can use one of those. F is one of the Yeah, don't play the dogs. Don't play the dogs. Right? So by monotonicity, right? By monotonicity, we know that everything to the right here is going to be bigger than that, mm -hmm. right? So at t naught we cross into it, and then um, after that we only get higher, right? And we never get beyond a because a was the supremum, right? So um, uh, for all for all t in x minus delta x, we have f of t is f of t is uh, bigger than uh, a minus epsilon, right? Bigger than a minus epsilon, right? So f of t is going to be bigger than or equal to f of t naught, right? Bigger than or equal to f of t naught, but f of t naught is bigger than bigger than a epsilon, and these guys are, are smaller than a. Right? So we found a half neighborhood that gets mapped into into our epsilon neighborhood. Right? So f of our half neighborhood is contained inside our epsilon neighborhood of a. Okay. Any, any questions about that? Um, okay, so, and you, of course you can do the same thing for, for right-handed neighbor, for right-handed limits, so let's do the, let's do the second proof now. Um, This thing is less than or equal to this thing. Right? The left handed limit, the right handed limit at x is less than or equal to the left handed limit at y. Okay. But the proof of this is, is very straightforward. You say, well, look, um, let me look at the interval x, x, y. Okay. Consider the interval x, y. Certainly, the infimum uh, of f of t on x, y is less than or equal to the supremum. Of, um, of f of t on x, y. Okay. The infimum is less than the supremum. Not surprising. Okay. Okay. But then you say, well, um, if I throw in uh, everything to a, right? If I throw in uh, all the values down to a. So suppose now I, I take the infimum down to a of, of f of t, right? The, uh, 
Uh, wait a second, what am I doing? No, 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 I'm sorry, what am I doing? I don't want to do that, sorry. I take the infimum, sorry, over the right side, sorry, from x to b. Sorry. I take the infimum from x to b. So I just throw in, throw in the values from, from, from y onwards, okay? Well, those values are all greater than these values, right? Greater than or equal to these values. So the infimum doesn't change, right? The infimum doesn't change, right? So I get this, right? And similarly, if I throw in all the values down to A here, uh, down to A here, then the infimum doesn't change. But in the previous, in the previous uh, thing, we, we said, we noticed that this is the limit from the right-hand side of, of x, and this guy is the limit from the left-hand side of y. Okay, so that's it. Right. Yes? Uh, should the inequality be strict in case the um, function is not continuous? Uh, all we know is that it's less than or equal to, right? Our function could be flat, for example, right? We have a monotonic, we have a monotonic function, um, monotonic increasing function. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Let me let me finish up with one you know, mildly interesting thing. Um, okay. So if uh, if f is monotonic. On AB, then the set of discontinuities, discontinuities, is countable. The set of discontinuities is countable. Okay. Okay. And so the proof is pretty. Is is, is kind of funny. Um, what you say is you say, well, look, uh, suppose uh, f is discontinuous at some point. Okay. That means that um, the limit from the left doesn't equal to the limit from the right. right. The limit from the left is not equal to the limit from the right. But um, it has to be less than, right? It has to be less than, right? And it's, it's less than or equal to. The limit from the left is less than the limit from the right. No, this is right. Okay, so um, uh, by the Archimedean principle, by Archimedean principle, by Archimedean property, uh, choose a rational number. Uh, R, R of x in that interval f of x minus f of x plus. Okay. Um, uh, so you know you, you see what's going to happen um, for every for every discontinuity you associate a rational number. Right. Every discontinuity is associated with a rational number, and as you go, you know, because of the because of the previous result, um, you know that the rational numbers are going to be different, right? If if I've got two discontinuities at x and at y, well, I know that um, that the rational number is not going to overlap, right? Because of because of this, right? X. The limit from the right hand side is less than or equal to the limit from the left hand side. Right? So I choose a I choose a rational number inside the open open interval 
and so none of these rational numbers are going to be equal. Right? So notice that um, if uh, notice if x1 is less than x2, then r of x1 has to be less than r of x2. Okay. And so the discontinuities, so the discontinuities uh, are one to one with a subset of Q. And so they are, sorry, at most countable. <coughs> so they are at most countable. Yeah. Can you explain the one-to-one -one with the R of X1 and R of X2? Well, suppose you've got two discontinuities. <coughs> okay. Suppose you've got dis two discontinuities. Um, by this thing, the right-handed limit here is less than or equal to, to the left-handed limit here. And I'm choosing a rational point inside, inside this, this interval, right? So inside this open interval. So I'm never going to have um, uh, two identical ones, right? Because at the very worst, at the very worst, I have something like this, right? But even so, I'm not going to choose the same one. OK, sorry to keep you over.